the folks who signed up are joining us now. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eve Miari and I'm with the Clean Air Council. Um, tonight's webinar is Penny's Pipeline, a winnable campaign to protect the Delaware River watershed. And Jack, if you can take us to the next slide, I'll tell you about our presenters tonight. We have Jack Byerly as an advocacy coordinator at Clean Air Council. We have with us Linda Chrisman from Carbon County. She's a founder and director of Save Carbon County, and she's been involved in um, landowner opposition to Penn East for about six years. We also have with us Tom Gilbert, who's campaign director with New Jersey Conservation Foundation. New Jersey Conservation Foundation has also been incredibly active on Penn East on the New Jersey side, um, fighting right alongside landowners for landowner rights. Um, and again, I'm Eve Miari. I'm an advocacy coordinator at Clean Air Council. Um, and I actually grew up in an area that is um, slated to be impacted by Penn East. So my family is, is impacted as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. Great. So uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, I want to begin by giving you a little bit of a background on the work of the Clean Air Council. So Clean Air Council is Pennsylvania's oldest nonprofit environmental organization. We're a member supported uh, organization. We serve the Mid-Atlantic region. And in our mission, we are dedicated to protecting and defending everyone's right to a healthy environment. So we work through an array of related sustainability and public health initiatives, including mitigating the environmental and health impacts of dirty energy, promoting clean, sustainable energy. We also focus on climate change policy, sustainable transportation, and protecting our watersheds, especially the Delaware River watershed. Uh, we seek to make positive and lasting changes in each of these areas through uh, public education, community action, government oversight, and uh, enforcement of environmental laws. So here's a quick overview of tonight's webinar. We're first gonna be going over uh, a bit of background information. What is the Penn East Pipeline and why is there cause for concern? We're then gonna take you through some of the impacts to the Delaware River watershed. We're then gonna go over the regulatory and legal history of Penn East and uh, bring you up to speed on where we are today uh, with the phase one and phase two proposal. We're then gonna go through Clean Air Council's response to uh, the Penn East permit applications to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And then we're gonna be uh, going over how you can take action and how you can submit comments and stay engaged. And now I'm going to hand it off to uh, Eve Miari. She'll uh, be taking you through some background information on Penn East. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, so Penn East was originally planned to be an interstate natural gas pipeline um, that would start in Pennsylvania, up in the Poconos, Luzerne County, um, moving through Carbon and Monroe County, and then heading over into New Jersey, into Hunterdon and Mercer counties. Um, so 120 miles originally planned to cross Pennsylvania into New Jersey. And I'm using the word original because what we're gonna talk about tonight is how that plan has changed. Um, how the opposition in New Jersey has been so strong that we now have a new plan from Penn East to um, start a phase one in Pennsylvania only. Um, but this is 120 mile of a fracked gas pipeline, 36 inch pipeline with a maximum allowable operating pressure of 1480. Um, this is a greenfield pipeline, meaning that it's an entirely new, um, or for the most part, new right of way. Um, so newly impacted landowners and owned by Penn East Company and a number of other stakeholders, uh, AGL, NGR, PSEG, SGI, Spectra, UGI. So can go to the next slide. So this is the original route. Um, and we'll look at this slide again later in the presentation so you can see how things have changed. Um, you can see how the route start, starts up in Luzerne County, moves through Carbon County, Northampton County, tiny bit of Bucks, and then into Hunterdon and Mercer counties. Almost 90% in the Delaware River watershed, crossing public and private lands, conservation lands, farmland, um, woodland, wetland, valuable natural resources, historic resources. Um, the plan calls for one new compressor station in Kidder Township, um, Carbon County, near where Linda lives and also um, expanding the compressor station in Lambertville, New Jersey. Um, that expansion is actually underway. That's the area where I grew up. And I'm gonna pass this over to Linda to talk a little bit about why this has been cause for so much concern among landowners and residents. 
Um, speaking on behalf of landowners uh, who are facing eminent domain, one of our impacted landowners told me, you think you own a piece of land until somebody bigger and richer comes along. My husband Roy and I live on a 23 acre farm. We put the land in farmland preservation. We wanted to preserve the land for farming, not for a pipeline. And this kind of thing is happening to all the landowners. Uh, their, their wishes and plans for the land they own are uh, at the mercy of a pipeline. Great, so, um, so Penny's construction poses numerous threats to the health of the watershed. Uh, as Eve mentioned, this is a greenfield pipeline, so its construction will involve removing the vegetation, so all the trees and plants along a new right-of-way. So removing native plants, which wildlife and fish depend on for food and cover, uh, allows invasive plants to get a foothold and spread throughout the region, uh, negatively impacting biodiversity. Penny's construction will also cause habitat fragmentation. So large undeveloped forests and grasslands that host a variety of species will be interrupted by areas permanently cleared for the pipeline, as well as new access roads. This will harm wildlife and aquatic life that rely on large undisturbed core habitats to thrive. Uh, Penny's development will also increase levels of erosion and stormwater runoff. Uh, causing flooding and landslides. Uh, so soil can absorb precipitation as easily without plants and trees to soak up the water. So more precipitation will flow into surrounding waterways causing flooding and erosion. Uh, and this runoff carries lots of loose sediment and uh, the sediment can uh, fill up habitats and stream beds. It can damage the gills of fish. The sediment also transports pollutants like fertilizers and oils and bacteria from the surrounding land into the waterway. So this contamination not only impacts the aquatic life and water quality, uh, it also in turn affects the, the recreation activities and, uh, that are dependent on the health of these, uh, of these streams. So um, there are two categories for how pipelines cross water bodies, trench and trenchless crossings. And each method has negative impacts on water quality and the aquatic habitat. Trench crossings involve digging a trench directly across the stream, laying the pipeline, and then backfilling. Uh, this is either done directly in the water, what is known as a wet ditch method, or uh, the pipeline is laid as the stream is temporarily diverted using pumps, dams, or other methods, and this is called a dry ditch method. Um, both of these methods increase sedimentation downstream, impacting water quality and aquatic life. Uh, the most common form of trenchless crossing is horizontal directional drilling, or HDD. During HDD, a drill bores a path from the pipeline underneath, uh, for the pipeline underneath the waterway or the wetland, uh, and the drilling fluid, which is referred to as drilling mud, uh, is composed of bentonite clay and water, and additives is injected into the bore to stabilize the, the walls of the borehole and also to cool um, the drill. Um, the drilling mud, however, can spill into waterways when drilling mud finds its way to the surface through natural crevices in the ground, and this is called an inadvertent return. And uh, you can see in this picture here, this is an inadvertent return in Delaware County uh, that was documented. And uh, inadvertent returns are not, uh, they're, they're not a rarity. They, they can be quite common. According to DEP, there were over 230 inadvertent returns during the construction of Mariner East. Uh, HDD can also cause sinkholes and it can contaminate drinking water sources by creating new pathways underground for contaminants like sediment or bacteria to flow into, uh, into drinking water wells. Um, so pennies will travel through some of the region's most valued conservation areas and most popular recreation destinations. You may recognize some of them on this map. Uh, a quarter of the land crossed in the Delaware River watershed is protected, fee simple, so owned outright by the state or a conservation organization or by easement, and this includes uh, both agricultural and conservation easements. There are six federally listed and 25 state listed threatened and endangered species that will be impacted by the pipeline, including the bog turtle and the dwarf wedge mussel. I'd like to just add the freshwater mussels like the dwarf wedge mussel play a key role in the watershed's health because they can naturally filter in clean water. Mussels naturally remove bacteria and chemical compounds from water bodies, they're nature's scrubbers. Uh, so the pipeline crosses or comes within 100 feet of six important bird and biodiversity areas. So these are sites of international significance for conservation of bird populations. And it's worth noting that in New Jersey, over 40% of the proposed uh, Penny's pipeline uh, crossing through New Jersey is routed through IBAs. 
Um, in addition to crossing these valuable conservation and recreation sites, Penn East will have 135 stream crossings in the Delaware River watershed. And 80 of those streams have high value designations. So in Pennsylvania, these are high quality, or HQ, uh, and exceptional value, EV streams. And in New Jersey, these are category one streams. These highly valued waterways are recognized by each state's Department of Environmental Protection for having the most outstanding water quality, uh, providing on-water recreation opportunities, and contributing to drinking water supplies. Uh, it's worth noting that each stream crossing poses concerns regardless of whether the stream has a high value designation, erosion and sedimentation, and inadvertent returns will harm aquatic life, it'll impact water quality um, in pristine high quality streams, but the pipeline's construction could also further degrade the water quality and habitat of streams that have lower designations or are already impaired. Um, we want to highlight just a few of the high value waterways and recreation conservation areas um, that will be impacted by Penn East. So here are a number of the, uh, of the sites, the, the high value waterways, conservation, recreation areas that the pipeline uh, will be crossing in, in Pennsylvania. Um, you may recognize uh, some of these. Um, Linda, would you like to, to speak on, on any of these sites? I know that some of them are, are up in your neck of the woods. Uh, every one but the Lower Delaware National Wild and Scenic River is in Carbon County. And Carbon County's largest industry and jobs producer is tourism. And most of that is ecotourism, uh, biking, rafting, hiking, fishing. And this pipeline plans to go through, as you can see, our most treasured and scenic areas. Everywhere it goes, it's going to leave a clear cut gash, which as Jack said, means erosion, sedimentation, uh, forest fragmentation. Beltsville is right across the street from my house. And in fact, the wild, Wild Creek Falls used to be part of the Chrisman Farm before the land was taken for a park. Now using eminent domain for a park that the public can enjoy is way different than for a pipeline's bottom line. These sites belong to everybody and they shouldn't be used uh, to make money for a pipeline company, which is about the only purpose I can see for this pipeline. Mm -hmm. So here are some of the high value waterways and conservation recreation areas in New Jersey that Penn East will be crossing, uh, including uh, 4,300 acres of uh, preserved open space and farmland will be impacted uh, by the pipelines crossing. Uh, Tom, would you like to, to speak to any of these sites? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jack, and thanks to the Clean Air Council for pulling this presentation together and uh, asking me to participate. So the New Jersey Conservation Foundation has been working to preserve land uh, all over New Jersey for well 60 years now and, uh, and also to defend those lands from a variety of threats. And we, we have worked with our partners for decades to preserve land in this area of New Jersey that's threatened by by Penn East. Uh, some of the first preserved farms in the state are in the, the Rosemont Valley. Um, we've preserved a variety of, of, of um, you know, gems along the Wickachoke Creek and, and the Wickachoke Greenway. Uh, this, this, this area of the state is just chock full of, of critical agricultural and historic and, and, and natural resources. So much of the land is preserved. And as you know here, the Penn East would, would cut through so many of those properties, a total of 4,300 acres of, uh, of preserved land, and including several properties that we've preserved and that we own. So we're actually directly impacted landowners of a, of a, different, uh, of a different type, obviously, than the, than the individual homeowners uh, who are unfortunately having to, to deal with this. And that's what drew us into this fight originally, is uh, sort of defending these lands against this um, you know, industrial, uh, industrial development of fossil fuel infrastructure. And we came to learn all the other impacts, um, the many threatened waterways, the C1 streams that Jack referred to, these beautiful streams that drain down into the Delaware River, uh, the critical, critical wildlife habitat. Um, and then the, the real kicker was when that we learned from gas experts that there's no need for this pipeline, that um, you know, there's more than enough pipeline capacity serving this region, even on uh, the coldest days of the winter when demand peaks, there's excess capacity and gas, you know, flowing flowing out of the region. So, 
uh, it's it's a, it's an outrage really that um, all these beautiful uh, lands and, and waters and 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 um, uh, these homeowners who you know who uh, sort of made their lives and livelihoods here would be put at risk for something that just simply isn't needed. And that's why we've we worked so hard with, with many other partners to uh, to vehemently oppose this project. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Linda, would you like to take us through some of the uh, the opposition to Penn East? Um, well, the opposition has been uh, landowners, as I've said, but also uh, environmentalists who care about the streams and the natural environment, even though their personal land is not being impacted. Uh, Safe Carbon County uh, and other groups were formed about six years ago when this pipeline started. And I think the key to success of the Penn East opposition has been that we don't give up and we persist. One of the reasons they have proposed this new pipeline is because they, they're seeing how impossible it's going to be to go through New Jersey. Uh, in the six years, uh, I've met people that I would never have met uh, without the pipeline, including the other panelists. And, um, the opposition in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania has become a community, a very determined community that is not going to give up. Um, in Carbon County and in other townships and counties along the route, one of the first things that the opposition did was go to each of the municipalities along the route and ask for resolutions in opposition to the pipeline. And um, as the slide says, there's more than 30 municipal res resolutions. In Carbon County, every township and the county itself uh, passed a resolution and registered as an intervener, which means that they can make comments to FERC about the project um, in an official capacity. In Pennsylvania, we don't have the legislative support uh, that you have in, in New Jersey. Our state government is very pro-fracking and pipelines. And therefore, I think the DEP um, is not able to do the kind of enforcement that uh, we would expect or that we deserve. Thank you, Linda. So Tom, would you like to take us through some of uh, the FERC regulatory history of the Penn East pipeline? Whoops. Um, you may be on mute. Do you want to try to unmute yourself? <laughs> we'll just give Tom one second. Let's see if we can get that working. It should be lower uh, left corner. And Jack, maybe you can see if you can unmute Tom. Oh. How about now? Can you yeah. hear me? There we go. Perfect. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I have I have problems with Zoom for some reason. <laughs> um, okay, great. So just wave if my sound goes out again. Okay, so so this has been a long battle. This began back in 2014 um, when Penny's first applied to FERC. And thanks to the really incredible opposition that Linda described. It took them until January of 2018 to um, get their conditional approval from from FERC, um, which is, is longer than than the process usually takes. Uh, but eventually, it always pretty much leads to the same outcome, where FERC approves virtually every project that comes before it. With that certificate in hand, they then quickly began to um, uh, go to court to uh, condemn a number of properties that they hadn't been able to negotiate with landowners. Most of those were in New Jersey. I believe there were a few in Pennsylvania as well. Um, and so the court did grant them initially that right to access lands and to begin the condemnation process. Um, but numerous landowners then um, uh, appealed that. Um, the state of, state of New Jersey appealed that decision. Um, and we did as well, and, and another land trust in New Jersey that had in, impacted lands as well. Um, and 
uh, ultimately that was uh, appealed to the Third Circuit of the U.S. Court of Appeals, and the court ruled that um, Penn East did not have the right under the Constitution, the uh, sovereign immunity clause of the Constitution, that a private uh, entity could not sue a state in federal court. Uh, and so basically the court uh, overturned Penn East's right to condemn the state preserved lands or any lands that the state had an interest in even through conservation easements. But so this was a big blow to Penn East in New Jersey because there were over 40 properties that the state either owned or held an interest in. And all of a sudden Penn East lost the right to access those lands to, and to, um, uh, to, to take them for the pipeline. So it basically shut them down in New Jersey. Um, Penn East has petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court in an effort to try to overturn that decision. Uh, there's actually a, a brief due to the Supreme Court from the state uh, and, and we're parties to that, um, which is due early next week. And then, you know, with perhaps within a month or so, we may know whether the Supreme Court is going to take that issue up. But unless and until Penn East is able to overturn that decision, they're, they're really stuck and unable to move forward. Uh, in New Jersey. So what they did in, in, the, uh, in the meantime is they filed a new application with FERC this January uh, proposing to build the project in two phases. So to build first in Pennsylvania and to have that done by next year and then to come back and build phase two into New Jersey a couple of years later. And I think this is essentially them hedging their bets that if they're unable to overturn the Third Circuit decision and move the original project forward, they're trying to sort of get half a loaf and see if they can get quick approvals and build in Pennsylvania um, where the Third Circuit uh, decision is not a, a, an obstacle to them. And then, you know, bide their time and see if they can come back ultimately and build phase two into New Jersey. Thanks, Tom. So Tom spoke about FERC, which is a federal regulatory agency. I'm going to speak about the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, which is a state regulatory agency. Um, the, the DEP in Pennsylvania requires two types of permits for a project like this, the Chapter 102 and Chapter 105. And really, these permits are required for any project that's going to cause earth disturbance greater than an acre. So it, it doesn't even have to be a pipeline. It could be a shopping mall. It could be a housing development. Um, these are the permits that um, we, we sort of collectively call them the water permits, but the Chapter 102 specifically are for erosion and sediment control. So these are permits that regulate stormwater both during and after construction, um, require best management practices to protect, maintain, reclaim, and restore water quality. And then the chapter 105, water obstruction and encroachment permits, these are required for any project that's gonna cross any type of waterway. It could be a stream, a lake, a river, wetland, anything. Um, and often for the larger projects, DEP will have a public comment period. We've seen um, numerous public comment periods associated, for example, with the Mariner East project, um, 102 and 105 permits, and um, that will give an, the public an opportunity to weigh in and provide additional information about um, the property that they know, the land that they know, um, and, and to voice any concerns if there are any. So where we're at right now with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, the original application was submitted in 2016. Um, it took a couple years for the PADEP to determine that that application was complete. Um, there was a 30-day uh, comment period last year, um, but then now we've had this, um, this sort of major change that's taken place um, in terms of proposing the phase one and phase two project. And DEP just, uh, just last week or two weeks ago issued deficiency letters um, to Penn East. The application is currently in technical review. Um, and one important thing to know is that even though there's no official public comment period, uh, Clean Air Council and our partners um, submitted a technical comment May 1st, um, sort of pointing out some of the, the problems that we see. And lo and behold, these deficiency letters came out two weeks later. Um, they're not necessarily directly connected to what we commented on, but I think it does speak to the fact that when we raise opposition um, within the, the permitting process, the DEP is taking notice. Um, and Tom, I'm going to send it back to you to talk a little bit more about um, NJDEP and DRBC. Okay, great. You can hear me? Yes. Good. 
So New Jersey DEP has been quite, quite good uh, on this project. They've actually denied permits uh, for the project twice now. Um, and these are, um, these are the uh, Section 401 uh, water quality permits, water quality certification under the Clean Water Act. And also New Jersey, um, New Jersey implements Section 404 of the wetlands provisions of the Clean Water Act. It's only one of two states that has um, uh, taken, taken the authority to implement that themselves. Um, and so most recently, when Penn East applied in 2019, uh, DEP rejected the permits primarily on the basis of the Third Circuit decision. So when the court ruled that Penn East had no legal authority over 42 properties that are required for the project, they lost the legal authority to apply for permits to develop those lands. So um, it was pretty easy for DEP at that point to reject the, the permits on, on that, base, that basis alone. Um, and then in terms of the Delaware River Basin Commission, this uh, multi multi state state federal you know compact with uh, with with authority over um, you know water 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 withdrawal and discharges and and water quality in the in the Delaware Basin uh, also needs to review and and approve this project. Um, so Penn East is definitely trying some real um, kind of monkey business with DRBC. Um, they originally applied back in 2016. DRBC really never gave the project uh, um, you, you know, a, a, a significant uh, review process. They kind of sat on it for, for quite some time, you know, waiting for the other agencies to, to kind of go first. Um, in January of this year, at the same time that Penny submitted its, its new phased application to FERC, they withdrew their application from DRBC and essentially said, um, well, we're just going to um, move forward with phase one of the project and you don't have uh, jurisdiction, you don't have authority over that. Um, well, fortunately, uh, DRBC didn't agree with that point of view and many, many uh, of the opponents had, had voiced you know, concerns over this um, suggestion by Penn East. And there's been numerous back and forth between, uh, between Penn East and DRBC and the front docket with um, Penn East you know, basically um, totally denying, disagreeing with DRBC's assertion that they have jurisdiction over the project and just basically saying, well, we don't, we don't agree, but um, we will voluntarily submit an application to the agency as long as the agency agrees to review the project on our requested timeline, right? So um, they really had quite, quite a bit of nerve to, um, uh, I think, to kind of uh, suggest that, that they're the ones who are in a position to decide what DRBC's authority is and what DRBC's timeline is, and DRBC is uh, is pushing back on that, and thus far seems to be holding them accountable. And again, there's been great um, great opposition, certainly led by the uh, Delaware Riverkeeper and many others, to uh, to send that strong message to uh, to DRBC to hold them accountable. And I think again, this comes back to what you know uh, Penny's strategy here to try to get the quick build in Pennsylvania, and so they wanted to. You know, get get FERC's quick uh, approval to build in two phases. Um, you know, to basically dismiss DRBC's review. Hopefully, get their Pennsylvania permits and see if they can, you know, get half the pipeline built in, in Pennsylvania as quickly as possible. I think is clearly their strategy. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, just to bring you up to speed of where we're at today, um, we have this two-phase proposal from Penn East. The current proposal would have Penn East start the construction just in Pennsylvania, um, moving through the, the northern Poconos counties, and then coming south and actually interconnecting with Adelphia. So those of you who are tuning in from the southeast, you may be familiar with the Adelphia route that goes through um, you know, Bucks County and Montgomery and uh, Chester and Delaware counties. So now these two pipelines would interconnect and be part of one system. Um, our contention is that this is an entirely new plan. This is not a, a tiny modification to an old plan. This plan is so radically different that it should restart the entire regulatory process with a new application. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at today and why we are addressing um, our concerns to the PADEP. So next slide. 
Okay, so here we have the two maps and you kind of have to imagine um, how they would go together. Um, but if you start in the, the top left here in, in Luzerne County and you move through Carbon in Northampton and you get just east of Bethlehem, you can see this tiny little offshoot to the left. Um, that is actually where it would interconnect with Adelphia. So if you come over to the map on the right, um, you see where uh, Adelphia would pick up where Penn East leaves off. And now, instead of going into Hunterdon and Mercer counties, we're going down through the southeastern um, Pennsylvania counties and ending up at Marcus Hook, which is an export terminal on the Delaware River, um, also where Mariner East ends. Okay, so as I mentioned before, despite the fact that there's no official public comment period, um, Clean Air Council uh, found cause to submit a technical comment to the DEP along with our allies and our partners, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, Sierra Club, um, Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future, Bucks County Concerned Citizens Against the Pipeline, and Safe Carbon County. Um, and what we said in the technical comment is that, again, the project has just changed too much to be considered the same project. Um, DEP has already said that the plans are inaccurate and incomplete in some places. There's no efforts made to protect public and private wells. As, as Jack mentioned and others mentioned, um, the threats to the high value waterways and the recreation areas that, that Linda described. Construction would take much longer than the application states. As Tom said, there's no need for the pipeline. There's no public need. And um, this pipeline, like any pipeline, would exacerbate climate change because more pipelines mean more fracking and more pollution. So we said the, to the DEP, and we want to ask you to say to the DEP as well, that no permits should be granted right now when approval is still pending with the DRBC. No permits should be granted during the COVID-19 pandemic. PADEP is at reduced capacity, and these large construction projects need to wait until a safer time. And finally, and extremely important, renewed public participation is imperative. We have to have additional public comment periods. We have to have public hearings when it's safe to hold them so the public can weigh in on this radically different plan. The next slide. So this is a lot of information about how you can send a comment to the DEP. So I just wanna assure you that this webinar is going to be on our website, but that we are also going to be sending out an action alert tomorrow um, so you don't have to memorize all of this right now. You will get the action alert to your email if you signed up for the webinar or if you're a member of the Clean Air Council. Um, but basically, um, since, since the DEP came out with these deficiency letters on, uh, I believe it's May 13th, this starts a 60-day response period. So now we're waiting for Penn East to respond by July 13th. Once Penn East responds, DEP could grant those permits at any time in July or August. We could be looking at that at 102 and 105 permits being granted. And at that point, construction could start. Um, tree clearing could start. So that's a huge concern. So we really need folks to contact the DEP and let them know we, we strongly oppose this in Pennsylvania um, as well. And here are the reasons. Um, we need to let the DEP know that this is a radically different project, this is a radically new proposal, um, that it impacts us where we, we live, let them know how it impacts you, um, how it impacts the areas where you recreate, the local waterways, um, concerns about drinking water. And we really need to advocate for Pennsylvania DEP to treat this as a new application, not a modification. And we need to demand a public comment period on, actually on both sets of deficiency letters. We need to demand um, public comment and public participation. Next slide. Okay, so um, again, we will send the action alert out tomorrow. It will be on our website as well. So you'll have some very clear direction about how to, um, how to contact DEP. Um, and then moving forward, how can you stay engaged on Penn East, this um, project that is, that is really gonna impact both Northeast and Southeast Pennsylvania in major ways if it moves forward. Um, you can become a member of Clean Air Council by going to our website. At the website or using this, this link, you can also sign up for action alerts and take action so you'll know, you know, when are these comment periods coming up? When do you need to, to send something to FERC or DRBC or PADEP? You can follow us for updates as well. Um, you can actually sign up for Penn, Penn East notifications directly with some of the regulatory agencies, FERC and DR, DRBC. Um, 
And then it's really important also to connect with these amazing local groups, um, whether you're in Pennsylvania or New, Jer New Jersey, there are incredible local groups um, supporting residents. And I'm gonna actually send it back to Linda to talk about um, how to get in touch with these groups and the organizations supporting them. Um, if, you're, if you're new to this, uh, I think the Riverkeeper Network website is a very good place to uh, get the latest information. Plus you can review their archives to uh, see what's happened in the past. Um, DEP has a pipeline portal on their website and you can look up uh, Penn East on that portal and see what uh, permits they're being considered for. Uh, I put out a monthly report and I also have an extensive email uh, notification list. And if you'd like to um, be on the email list, uh, my uh, email address is, is on the next slide. Um, and uh, the, uh, the monthly report is published on the Heart HALT website. And uh, it, the report usually includes any regulatory activities, uh, court cases, and uh, other pipelines that might have an impact on Penn East. Uh, so it's an easy way to keep up to date. And I hope to see you uh, in one of these groups. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Linda. So there are a number of ways that Clean Air Council can help you stay engaged. Uh, we can consult with you around your concerns. You can always reach out to us if you have any concerns related to pipelines or pennies specifically. Uh, Clean Air Council can also support you in organizing a uh, municipal or county-based group of residents. Um, we have a lot of experience organizing groups around a range of environmental issues, and we can help you start a new group in your area. Uh, we can also support you in bringing resolutions and draft ordinances before your local municipal uh, or county council. Uh, we could help you uh, propose regulations like requiring buffer areas between pipelines and environmental resources like streams and floodplains or community uses like schools. And uh, municipalities can also require companies to submit environmental impact statements, which evaluate the direct and indirect, short-term, long-term, and cumulative uh, impacts from proposed projects and pipelines to streams, uh, rivers, and other environmental resources in the, in the local area. Um, we can also help you identify streams, uh, wetlands, and waterways near you that would be impacted uh, by Penn East and, uh, and need greater protection. Uh, we can also guide you in commenting to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and other reg regulatory bodies like DRBC and, and uh, NJ, New Jersey DEP, um, on, on permitting. Um, so there, yep, there are a number of ways that the Clean Air Council can support you as you stay engaged and uh, as you're taking action. Great. So I just want to point out that on the question and answer slide here, um, you do have the contact information for all of the presenters. Um, so if you um, have a question you'd like to follow up, please feel free to do so. And now we're going to move to questions. I see the first question coming in through the chat um, from Christina Morley. And uh, Christina's pointing out that a report was done last year by Cadmus on environmental threats um, posed by Penn East and Mariner East. Um, and she's asking if we can provide a link to that in the alert tomorrow. Yeah, we certainly can. Um, we actually worked, Clean Air Council worked very close with uh, New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Um, that's some of the work that we've done in the past with Tom um, to put out that report. And the report basically um, shows the, the potential devastation that can occur from a pipeline through the watershed um, using a lot of our experience with Mariner East as an example. Um, and some of the maps that you saw tonight come from that report. So yes, we can certainly give out that link. It's a really great resource. Um, if anybody else has a question, you can drop it either into the Q&A box or into the chat box, and we're happy to answer it live. Um, and certainly if you have questions after the webinar, um, you can feel free to reach out and we can answer over email as well. Any, any other participants have a question this evening? Okay. Oh, let's see. Uh, municipalities that pass the resolutions. Um, okay, so this is a great question. Um, in, we have uh, a number of other pipelines that residents have been, have been working on where uh, municipalities may have passed resolutions against the pipeline, but also accepted 
um, payment from the pipeline for township owned easements. And so um, this participant is asking if any of the mun municipalities that demonstrated opposition to Penn East through resolutions um, had also sold easements to Penn East. Um, Tom, Linda, do you know? Not, none in this area. Now, Penn East, Penn East will be applying for what they call street opening permits sure. and cross right of ways. Yes, there's a number of other permits that, um, that pipelines require locally from municipalities. Um, we do have another, a number of townships. Um, she says some townships along the Adelphia route have, to, have sold easements to Adelphia. Um, so that's something for our consideration. Okay. Tom, and, you're on mute. Okay, we have one more uh, question uh, from Barbara. In the event that the Supreme Court denies Penn East, how would that affect the work in Pennsylvania? Tom, I think you can speak to that. If, if the Supreme Court refuses to either take the Third Circuit appeal or takes the case and then um, rules against Penn East, does that affect Pennsylvania? Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think if the Supreme Court um, either doesn't uh, take the case or affirms a lower court ruling, then I think the project as currently proposed in New Jersey is, is done. I mean, there's no way I think they can move forward with the project as proposed in New Jersey. Um, I think in that, in, in that event, they could still, and I think likely would, um, seek to build phase one in Pennsylvania. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably why they took this approach is it's, they're kind of hedging their bets and this is their, their plan B um, that they um, uh, would, 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 would potentially try to move forward and get the approvals to build phase one. And then perhaps they would bide their time and see if at some future point they could come back and situation circumstances might change in New Jersey such that they could uh, make another run at, at uh, building phase two in New Jersey. Great, thank you. Can I add something? Yeah. Um, you know, just, I, I did say that Pennsylvania legislature is pretty much pro fracking, <clears throat> but that does not mean that this is a done deal. And I don't want people to think that that's the case. Their first, um, opportunity for co comment. We had eight, over 800 comments to FERC. And if we keep up at that level of engagement on this pipeline, I think we can stop them in Pennsylvania. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Um, we have a question from Jim. If a township sent a resolution against Penn East earlier, does it still stand? So maybe some of these townships um, passed resolutions of concern maybe four or five, six years ago. Should, should we, uh, do those still stand? Should they, um, should they pass them again? What are your thoughts on that, Linda and Tom? Uh, in, in Carbon County, we've gone around to all the townships again and asked them to come, become interveners. We did not ask them to uh, pass another resolution against the Pennsylvania only version of this. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm concerned, their first resolution still stands because they still have the same uh, environmental impact. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, looks like the Q&A and the chat are empty. So I'll give it another half a minute to see if anybody has anything. Okay. Well, I just want to thank our panelists so much for, for being with us tonight. Linda and Tom, you've been involved in this work for so many years and you you don't give up. You're persistent and the landowners are persistent and the, the residents are persistent. And, and I think that's why this this has been so successful, this fight to um, to protect our watershed. So thank you so much for all that you do. And thank you for being here tonight and sharing so much important information with all of us. Thank you for your, uh, the Clean Air Council's leadership on this Pennsylvania only uh, project because we really need the help. So on that note, everybody keep an eye out for uh, an email that we'll be getting out to you later this week with um, instructions for how you can send a comment to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection um, and let them know that we need more public participation um, and that we're not giving up the fight.
So thank you so much everybody for joining us tonight. And um, we hope to, to see you at meetings in person when we get to the point that we can do that again. Um, and until then, we hope to see you at more upcoming webinars. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Keep up the fight.